turnout today. Uh, my name is Natalie Mathewson and I'm with Central Minnesota Council on Aging and I am the project lead for Chisago Age Well. How many have you guys, how many have you been to a Dine and Discover before? I recognize a few of you. Okay, yep. How, and how many of you heard of Chisago Age Well? Great, okay, cool. Well, so we have been um, around for a couple of years now. It's a Chicago Age Well Coalition made up of about 30 local agencies, nonprofits, health systems, and community members um, that are working together um, to offer education events. And um, also, and the goal really in the mission is to um, get the word out um, that uh, for these events, as well as what's out there in our community in Chisago County, as far as services, and also not just like home care services and things like that, but what's out there also for activities. So we have a Chisago Age Well website, chisagoagewell.org, um, that you can find resources on, and there's also activities. In addition to that, we have a Facebook page, um, Chisago Age Well Facebook page. Uh, some of you have picked up, we have the gold um, quick reference guides that have some references as well as our website on there. So um, upcoming events, you might have picked up the um, AgeWell Expo. We have an AgeWell Expo that's coming in October 18th at the Chisago Lakes Area High School from 10 to 3. Um, that's going to be an awesome event where um, the team's been really excited working on that. Um, this is our, I don't know how many, we started having Dining Discovers last June 2018, and through May we had had about 500 people attend them. So today we're having about 100 people attend the three events today. So awesome. Obviously this is a very hot topic, and I listened to our two speakers this morning in North Branch, and you guys are in for a treat. Um, the other thing is, coming up in November, our next Dine and Discover is Beating the Holiday Blues, and we have a mental health professional talking about just um, depression, anxiety, and things that come around the holidays, whether it be, be maybe a loss of a family member that you had, maybe you're a caregiver, maybe you're feeling isolated, so um, watch for that. That's coming up as well. And I am going to pass it over to Leilani, and she is going to introduce our speakers. Thank you. I'm Leilani Freeman. I'm a community connector with the Chisago Age Well Coalition. So that means I try to connect all of you with the resources available in the community. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our tag team speakers. I understand they like to tag team to talk to you about uh, estate planning, wills, and trusts. They're very familiar faces in our community. Greg Payne is uh, our uh, first speaker. I, well, they jointly speak, but thanks to guidance from his father at an early age, Greg Payne learned the value of compound interest and purchased his first share of AT&T stock at age 13. He went on to earn a Bachelor of Science degree in economics from Miami of Ohio and an MBA from Indiana U University. As a chartered retirement planning counselor, he provides customized financial planning at Edward Jones in Chisago City. Payne and his wife Tanya and their two children live in the Chisago Lakes area, where Greg is involved with the Chisago Lakes Rotary, the Chisago Lakes Chamber of Commerce, and the Trio Wolf Creek School Board. His partner in crime here today is Rob Collins. Rob grew up in the Chisago Lakes Forest Lake area and graduated from McAllister College in St. Paul with a triple major in political science, economics, and philosophy. He earned his Juris Doctorate degree from Hamlin University School of Law and has been practicing law in Forest Lake since 1993. He advises clients in estate planning, elder law, probate, residential and commercial real estate, and civil mediation. He and his family live in Forest Lake, where Rob has been active with the Boy Scouts, the Lakes Area Youth Service Bureau, the Forest Lake Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Forest Lake Rotary. He has also served as the director on the Ackerman Life Points Community Council in Chisago City. Please join me in welcoming Greg Payne and Rob Collins. Before we begin today, I think it's very important that we just take a moment to remember. Today is September 11th, 
a day that changed our nation forever. And we owe an unpayable debt to the men, the women, the children, the passengers, and the first responders. I would ask if you would join me today in say, standing to say the Pledge of Allegiance and then a moment of silence following. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Who here is a uh, member of the military <coughs> armed, armed forces? Veterans. Veterans. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for what you did. Thank you for the sacrifice you made and for the country that we have because of you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I do, I, I love this community. And I'll tell you one of the things that has so impressed me about the community that we live in are all the organizations that are here to help and support to grow and to build our community. Did you know that the Agewell Coalition has over 30 organizations that support it actively, as well as many community volunteers? That's very unique. We live in a very special community. And I'm very grateful for that, and I hope you will help me thank them, because they put all these programs together, all free of charge for you for us. Um, thank you very much. Okay, so today, um, you made a choice to come here today to take time out of your schedule uh, to learn a little something about estates, wills, and trusts. First disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. I do not do taxes. I'm a financial planner. Um, one guy came here with the right shirt on. Can you see this? You can't see this. No. Billionaire in progress. <laughs> we need to talk. Just kidding. Um, so I work with people to help build, amass, and protect. In order to do that, we need to plan for what's expected. We know that certain things will happen in life. It's very knowable. But there's things that are unknowable and unexpected, but we can still plan for that. We need to make sure that we position our portfolio for both. Now, in order to do that, I need help, because I can't do that alone. I need a team. You need a team. You need to have an advisor, but you also need to have someone that understands law, and not just any law. You need to have someone on your team that understands is state law specifically. That's why Rob is here. That's why I work with Rob. I talked to him earlier and I said, hey, what do we want to cover? He starts saying, I'm like, let's cover it all. He said, great, you must be mad. You know how long that would take? So we're going to do our best to cover as much of it as we can today. But in all fairness and honesty, it's going to be the tip of the iceberg. What I want to know before we get started so that we can adjust our presentation to you. Why did you come? <coughs> Why are you here? Curiosity. Curiosity. Free lunch. <laughs> Please. Now to have happen in my immediate family that happened in my siblings family. I uh, Maybe you've seen something happen in someone else's life that didn't go quite the way they wanted it to go. A lot of those issues probably can be addressed, probably can be planned for, most likely can be prevented from going a different direction than what you want. Why did you guys come? <laughs> Romanian planning. 
because we want to go through probate. Oh, wait. No, 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 no. We don't want to go through probate. Absolutely. I hear a lot of things. Clients talk to me about, do I need a will? Do I need a trust? What can a trust do? What won't a trust do? Do I really need to name beneficiaries? How important is that? My guess is you're here for the reasons that were mentioned by some of you, but in addition, because you've got some goals. It might be around making sure that your assets get transferred to the right people in the right way. It might be to protect yourself and your family should you become incapacitated. Unfortunately, this is all temporary. Money lives forever. How do we reconcile those differences? Do you have guardians or minors, children or grandchildren, or someone that you really care about that you want to be able to provide for in your absence? There, is there a charity? Is there a legacy that you choose to leave behind? And do you want the US government to be one of your beneficiaries? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't met that person yet. <laughs> If you own a business or a large piece of land, how are you going to make sure that that business continues or that land stays in the family? Those are all things that could be part of your goal when it comes to estate planning. We're going to walk through each one of these issues in front of us. And I'd say they're, they're kind of in a, an important order here. Account registration is key. It's so important, it was the very first thing that Rob said to me when I spoke with him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I, I have learned over, over my career that the keys to the kingdom of estate planning is that the way assets are titled is the way they will pass. And so when we're doing our estate planning, the first thing we want to do is uh, this account registration take an inventory of what we have, right? Most people will have an IRA or two, right? They might have a bank account or two. They might have some uh, CDs. They might have a piece of real estate that they live in. And they also might have, say, a cabin. But most times, we've got 10 items or less that we're really having to deal with when we go through this uh, process. And so the, the registration piece is that initial inventory, what do we have? And I love it. Key, well, keys to the kingdom, if there's one thing you remember, it came right from Rob. <laughs> Make sure it's registered. Maybe the second most important thing is beneficiary designation. You've heard that a thousand times. I'm constantly calling my clients, talking about the beneficiaries, maybe to the point where they're thinking, what is wrong with this guy? Why is he constantly asking about beneficiaries? Well, we'll talk about why that's so critically important here real soon. What's a will? You probably know what a will is, or at least you've got a good concept of it. Do you need one? How important is that? Or would a trust be okay instead of a will? Or do you need both? How does this all work? And let's understand from a taxation perspective, are there ways that we can optimize, and optimize by that I mean minimize what we're paying in our taxes? Does life insurance play a role here for you? It might, it might not. And then the good old transfer on death. We'll go through each one of those in order. Now, as we're going through, please ask questions. You don't need to hold them till the end. We will customize this presentation. And what we found is that it's probably going to evolve into a generalized conversation here in the next 10 minutes or so. So cue up your questions. Let's talk about account registration. Rob kind of touched on it already. Investments. All of your investments have got to be registered the right way. Your bank accounts, your retirement accounts, your insurance policies, even your pension, and any personal property that you have. Because the way that they're registered determines what happens to them when you're gone. So we'll, uh, we'll give some, do you want to give some examples of times where that has caused um, either problems or created opportunities for clients that you've worked with? <coughs> Or with the, uh, 
assets not being titled properly or beneficiary designations. Yeah, we'll do um, both of those kind of simultaneously. The, the key reason I bring this up is right here. Okay. Accounts that designate a beneficiary are not controlled by a will or a trust. All right. Judy, you and I are going to have a chat. All right. So let's say that I have a $100,000 life insurance policy, and I've named Judy as the beneficiary on that. Okay? And then I, I go through my estate plan and I create a will, and my will says that everything I have, I want to go to my wife, Tammy. Okay? So, um, and then I, I go ahead and I pass away, and my will says everything goes to Tammy, but my life insurance designation says everything goes to Judy. So, or I'm sorry, the life insurance goes to Judy. Where does the life insurance go? Judy. 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 If my plan all along was that I wanted everything to go to Tammy, the way that I had titled that life insurance with Judy as the beneficiary um, uh, will control over a will, and it'll control over the way you have the trust set up as well. So the way that you have your assets titled is the way that they will pass. Um, if I give a real quick example of that, um, which happened unfortunately to someone that I know, uh, this gentleman had five children, but he loved one more than the others. <laughs> he, didn't want us, he didn't want us to know that, but we found that out, unfortunately. And we found it out in a very unfortunate way. Because after his passing, the favorite child came walking into my office, will in hand, plopped it down and said, give me the money. To which I unfortunately had to say, I am sorry, but your dad had already designated beneficiaries for all of his assets, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20%, equally distributed across all of the kids. He looked at me and said, you've got to be king, but I've already paid for the funeral. I've already paid all of his medical bills. I'm in the hole. And to which I had to reply yet again, I am very sorry, but your father designated beneficiaries equally across all the kids so the fi favorite child not only didn't get the bulk of you know, the assets that dad wanted him to have, he actually ended up in the hole, negative. And do you think at that point the other kids wanted to chip in and help him? Time for the So getting the beneficiary right matters. That matters. What's a will? Does everyone have a will? Mm -hmm. We all have a will. <coughs> it's, a, it's a document. <laughs> it's a document that governs how your assets are going to be distributed. And it determines where things are going to go. Right? So if you have a will, you're covered, right? Am I covered if I have a will and nothing else? It depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah. it depends. So, what is it, the, the way I like to describe it, and Rob will elaborate on this in, in much greater detail, but the way I like to describe a will is it's a really nice set of recommendations for the judge. And that's pretty much the way it goes. Do you care to elaborate on that? Yeah, you know, a will is, is very much a list of instructions for the probate court. A, a will says, you know, after I die, uh, I would like uh, Greg to be my personal representative, right? And then his job would be to gather my assets, uh, pay my bills, and then distribute the rest according to the terms of my will. And if that happens to be, say, to my three kids, uh, then that's what he would do. But a will doesn't get anyone out of probate, okay? A will is a list of instructions to the probate court, and it applies to... Uh, those assets that are in our names at the time that we die that don't have a beneficiary uh, listed on them um, or if we have real estate in our names that uh, doesn't transfer as a result of our passing to someone else, uh, a will would apply to that. So then we're, we're looking at having to get into probate to uh, have that will um, read by the court and administered by the person representative. So that would be an estate going into intestacy. Intestacy is uh, 
Uh, that's what happens when we die without a will. A, a, a will you've heard of is the last will and testament. You know, hear that once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, testacy, <laughs> if you die testate, then you die with a will. Intestacy is dying without a will. And essentially that means that the state has set up a will for us. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it says that, you know, if, if I die and I have things that are in my name that I didn't set up with a proper beneficiary or a transfer document um, and they have to go through probate, um, uh, the, the, the intestate statutes will set up how things pass. Uh, generally, things pass to uh, a spouse uh, and then uh, uh, to kids. Uh, but sometimes we bump into this issue, and this is a very important one that I, I'd like everyone here to, uh, to, to take a look at their deed, the deed to their house, right? Anyone who has a house? If you own that house with someone else, I'd like you to take a look at that deed and make sure it says as joint tenants. Because joint tenancy in Minnesota means last to die wins, right? So if uh, Greg and I own property and it says Greg and Rob as joint tenants and I die, it'll automatically go to him, okay? If it says Greg and Rob but does not say joint tenants and I die, my half of that property will go either according to the terms of my will or according to the terms of intestacy. Now, if that happened to be hunting land, right, um, it would end up uh, getting over to my spouse. However, Tammy, however, if I have property in my name and I haven't listed Tammy, my wife, as, the beneficia as, as a joint owner, right, it just says Rob Collins, <coughs> and I die, and that's the homestead. The homestead descends a little differently than regular property. And so since Tammy and I have three kids, if I were to die, the homestead would pass to her for life, and then a remainder interest to my three kids, which essentially means that if I died, Tammy would lose her spouse and control of the house on the same day, because she only has a portion, and the kids have a remainder interest, which means it would take all four of them, plus anybody, any uh, spouses, to sell that property. Okay, so when we're starting to deal with intestacy, uh, we we kind of get into that realm of what some people don't know is coming. We can end up in with a result that we don't want, an, an unintended result. Oftentimes, people think that um, um, the house will automatically go to the spouse. And that just isn't always the case. And again, it goes back to how it's titled. Okay. It seems like a lot of it comes back to some pretty simple principles <laughs> right at the beginning. Yeah. Um, let's talk about an executor briefly. So, do you know who you're going to select to be the executor of your will? Do you know who that is? Have you thought about that? And then more importantly, do they know <laughs> they're the executor? And do they know what that means? Do they really know what that means? And are they prepared and capable and willing to fulfill those shoes? It sounds like an honor. First time my parents talked to me, I thought, chest puffs up a little bit. I thought, yeah. <laughs> And then it hits me, oh, <laughs> there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. So understanding what that role really means and making sure that you're prepared for that role is going to be crucial. And are you going to take the executor and make their life easy? So in other words, they're going to have to establish the validity of the will. Do they know where it's located? They're going to have to collect assets of the estate. Is it all in one neat little binder that they can just grab? Or are they going to go hunting through your drawers? Even the garage, I've found. <laughs> uh, they're going to file your last tax return for you. They're going to distribute the assets to the trustees or the beneficiaries. And they're going to pay for your funeral and any <coughs> medical bills or, or outstanding expenses. That's so much fun. 
Mm -hmm. question. We had a discussion about the distribution of um, to the beneficiaries the other day. Uh, the, the executor would not actually be distributing the assets per se, would they be informing the beneficiaries of where to go to get their assets? So they fill out the forms like I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the trick right out of the law book that I learned from Rob. Mm. It depends. And then I'm going to punt and let Rob answer. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. It really does. Um, the, the question, um, if, I can, if I get it right here, is that uh, is the role of the executor to also help beneficiaries of accounts that are outside the estate? Um, learn about them, know about them, and <coughs> help them collect. Um, generally, the executor is um, appointed by the court to handle the probate assets. And when you're administering the estate, typically they would try to work with the financial advisor <coughs> to um, identify who might have uh, non-probate assets. Those would be those with the beneficiaries, again, an IRA with the beneficiary and so forth. So typically they do, um, but they don't always have to. Let's put it that way. I guess I'm not, I'm probably going to get my question right. Okay. My question is, if there are beneficiaries on accounts, yep. the administrator or the executor would not get the money and then they actually get the money. Correct. They they Correct. Yep. The okay. So the question now is, if there's a beneficiary listed, does that money go to the estate first and then get distributed? And that answer is no. If, if you've named uh, beneficiaries on your account and you die, those dollars do not run through the probate estate. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. In so, your, in your, uh, at your table, everyone has one of these books, the probate and planning book. If you look at page 26. Yeah. So what if you've prepaid all your funereal expenses, you have it down to everything but the date? It sounds like you're very organized then. How is that affected? If you've got it all paid up to the date? up front, I mean, yep. it's in a policy. Then, then that's one less thing your uh, executor is going to have to deal with. Right, that's going to be a nice thing. Now he's going to ultimately make sure that it carried out. That it's carried out. That um, whoever whoever is whoever you prepaid that they actually follow through and you know, make you know, sure the body up. Uh, yep, make sure make sure it all ends up where it's supposed to go, right? Absolutely. Um, so having those conversations and they're tough conversations. Have any conversation on mortality is a difficult conversation, but having those conversations up front, let me assure you of something: it will not increase the rate at which you expire. <laughs> it will not change anything about your health. But what it will do is it will create immense family understanding and take a lot of anxiety off the table. So I highly encourage you to have that. One thing to remember, though, it gets less painful the older you are. That's good, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still going to be learning, learning that one. We'll get, right, we'll get right to it, but there's a question here. How do you establish the role of an executor? Only through a will? I mean, how do you name your executor? Yeah. It, typically, an executor um, uh, would be established through the will, and then the will doesn't really have much authority until it gets open in probate. Did you have a question? If, if not, I mean, the, the judge will assign one. If you, if you haven't done it, then the judge will assign one. But that's probably not the ideal way to, to go. So I have, I have a will. Yeah. My executor is an attorney. Mm -hmm. He has complete power of attorney. Yep. My my will is a hundred percent charitable. Mm -hmm. Should I should I even be here? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you are in the right place. You can help everyone else here. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't the power of attorney assigned by the? Okay. Uh, power of attorney is a form, the, the, the question that she has is, isn't a power of attorney um, assigned by the executor? Now, there's, there's a couple of different documents that end up in play here, and one of them is called power of attorney. Now, a power of attorney form is one that we 
where a person signs to give another person authority to sign their name while they're alive. Okay, so if I give Greg power of attorney for me, he'll be able to sign my name while I'm alive for business, real estate, um, and financial transactions, okay? That, uh, that authority expires when I do. So when I die, powers of attorney, my power of attorney expires. D don't look surprised. That's very few people realize that. Um, yeah. I would say the majority of people that I work with are surprised when they learn that. Yeah. So then what? Well, we'll get there. So <laughs> the, power, the power of attorney expires on death, right? Yeah. And a couple things with the power of attorney. Um, some people want that power of attorney to be effective if you're incapacitated or incompetent. That means it's durable. Most of the uh, power of attorney forms, and I think there's one in the, the book that you have on probate and planning, um, has a box where you would check this power of attorney continues to be effective if I'm incapacitated or incompetent. That makes it durable. So when you're hearing the word durable, just kind of think in your mind, oh, that just means if I'm incapacitated that it'll still be effective, okay? So that's, that would be checked on, uh, on that box. Then to finish answering your question, there is a period after somebody dies that the power of attorney expires and there's no one who has authority to sign their name until a judge takes a look at that will right, and appoints a personal representative. That's true. So that's one of the things that the planning can help kind of avoid or minimize or not have any uh, lapse in authority at all. So, yeah. The word executor is interchangeable with personal representative, right? You are correct. Yep. Does that be affected, for example, we have our checking accounts signed by our kids? So if we die, they can pay the bills. All right. Should I tell them? How? Should I tell them? <laughs> I don't know if you like it, but yes. This is actually this is a really good question. <laughs> this is a great question. The question is, does any of this matter if we've already got our kids on our bank account? Mm -hmm. yes. Right? Mm -hmm. That's essentially it? Okay. A couple of things with this. You know, in Minnesota, we don't always like to end up having any confrontation or conflict, right? <laughs> so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll go into the bank, right, and we'll go and sit down across the table from uh, a nice uh, uh, a personal banker and we'll say, you know what, uh, 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 Jenny, is, is everything okay with my account? She's going to look at your account. She's going to say, yeah, everything is okay, right? It's just the way you want it. Okay, that's great. So you go home and you call your daughter and you say, you know, I talked to Jenny at the bank today and everything is just fine, right? And so we don't think about it again. Jenny's like, that's great. It's just fine. Well, then what happens is you go and die on us, right? The next thing we know, Jenny goes into the bank and they say, well, Jenny, you have to go through probate. And she says, well, why is that? Well, because everything was fine for you while you were alive, but you didn't ask the right questions. So what my challenge to you today is after you've checked your deed to make sure that it reads the way you want, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to some real estate stuff, but I also want you to talk to your personal banker and your financial advisor to make sure that your accounts are set up the way you want. And I want you to ask these questions, okay? Who can sign while I'm alive? Right? And if you get an answer that you don't want, you ask them, how can I change this to get the answer that I want? So if I want Greg to be able to sign, then I, and they say, well, no, he can't sign right now, then I'm going to have him put on. And what does that mean? He might have to come in. He might, whatever the case is, make sure that happens. Now, that's while I'm alive. Okay? Then I want to ask, what happens when I die? Right? Because we don't always want to talk about that. Um, what happens if I die? Will Greg still have signing authority? And they'll say, no, he, you just put him on as a signer, which is kind of like a power of attorney. Right? He doesn't have like ownership or beneficiary. It doesn't extend past death. So you want to ask your banker. Right? I want to make sure that Greg will continue to have authority to sign after I die. What do I have to do with this account to make sure that it, that happens? And then I want to make sure I know who owns that account after I die, right? Does it go to him? Or your question, does it go to my estate, right? Where does, where does it go? Okay, and so that we can be sure. And, and when, when they say it goes to your estate, 
That's code for probate. Okay? <laughs> a lot of people will say, oh, that's great, it's going to my estate. Well, that's code for probate. That means we're going to go into court, open up a file, and get going with probate. Okay? So, so Rob, let's make sure that we address what's wrong with probate. Why do we not want probate? <laughs> probate, I mean, right? What's the problem with probate? Time. Expenses. Time, expense. Yeah. Wait, not go the way you want. Wait, not go the way you want. Cost money, time, expense. You, you want to give them some, uh, some figures? Um, sure. Well, probate is a, is a process that we go through to get someone authorized to sign your name after you die. So probate is really about one word, authority. Well, I'm alive. I can sign my name. I can give my property away. I can sell it. I can transfer it. I can retitle it, right, however I want. I can, I can uh, name a joint owner, I can put it in a trust. There's any number of things I can do to make sure that I avoid probate. But after I die, I can't sign anymore. Okay, so this is your question now about that lapse, right? Um, probate answers that question, who gets to sign your name after you die? We file some paperwork with the court. There's an application, there's an oath, there's, sometimes there's consents, right? And we get that all filed with the court. And then uh, the court will process that. <clears throat> There's sort of two tracks that we can go down. One's formal and one's informal. If we go down an informal track, we typically are not going to have to go to court um, and see a judge. And an informal track, the, the general rules on that are if, if, if it is testate, if we have a will, uh, it's a valid will. Um, and if, uh, and they, it has to be solvent, okay? Meaning we've got more assets than we have liabilities. If that's the case, most times it can go informal. We would file work, paperwork with the court. They would process that. They issue a notice, right, a notice to creditors. And that notice to creditors gets sent to everybody um, that the decedent owed money to, okay? So MasterCard, Visa, um, uh, if, uh, if there's a, a, a private, private loan and so forth, anyone you owed money to, any creditor that gets sent to. They also notice the state, okay, so we have to send a copy of that notice to the state, and then they would let us know whether the decedent, again, the person who died, uh, received medical assistance or any other uh, government benefits that, needs to, that need to be repaid. Because some government benefits that we get are actually loans from the government, and they expect to be paid. They're not really just gifts from the government, okay? And so uh, if they want to be paid back, they will let us know through probate. Uh, shortly after that, we'll end up uh, getting what's called letters, which is a one-page document that says Greg is authorized to act on behalf of Rob's estate. Okay, so his job now, he's authorized to sign my name. We've, that gap is now done, right? He was my power of attorney. I died. It took about six weeks from the date of my death to get things processed uh, and then to get uh, the, the paperwork filed with the court. And now Greg's authorized to sign my name. Um, as my personal representative. His job as personal representative is to gather my assets, right? So he's gonna gather up my probate assets, but again, not the non-probate ones, not the ones that went to other people. He'll gather my probate ones, and then he will um, pay my bills, and then distribute the rest according to the terms of my will, which we've already decided says everything goes to Tammy, okay? There's a four month waiting period Okay, for creditors to, uh, creditors to submit claims. So that's one of the things that gets frustrating with probate is we have to wait that four months out. Mm -hmm. At the end of that four month period, we can start talking about uh, closing up the estate, okay? Um, during that four month period, we can be looking at liquidating some assets. Um, we're a little cautious about letting anybody make distributions during that four month period, which is typically why family members get frustrated, right? They've been gone for so long now, three months, how come I can't get my money, right? Mm -hmm. We have, by law, there's this period that creditors can submit claims. And if we give, if the person representative gives all the money away, mm -hmm. right, in the third month and then in the fourth month, we get a, a, a $55,000 claim from somebody saying that you owed them some money, where's that gonna come from? The more likely event is that it's not going to be a one, one big claim. We're going to get like three credit card bills because that's typically where, where we start running into some unknown stuff is it takes a little while for that to process or, or uh, cost of last illness, 
right? So we re do really do want to wait out that four month period and then at the end of that we can start looking at closing the estate. That also means that we have to do wherever it said final taxes. And so sometimes, again, we bump into a bad rap with probate because if we end up wrapping up our four months and we've sold our real estate and we're all done in uh, say April, right? We might have to wait all the way until February or so of the next year to file final tax returns. Now, many times we can start making some interim distributions. Uh, we can do some partial do documents to partially close the estate. There are some things that we can do, but it does tend to feel like it's dragging on a long time. And here's how that plays out when I work with clients. How does that affect income for, uh, such as bond maturity into the estate? The, the investments will continue to stay as they are if bonds mature. Well, they'll be going into the estate, into the mm -hmm. bank account is where they're they'll just be go They'll continue to go in there. They'll continue to go in. That won't change. Okay. okay. Matter of fact, once you die, there cannot be any transactions in the account because a dead per person can't authorize transactions. All right, so it's gonna it's gonna sit there. It'll, it'll go. stay. You can have income, but no. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. So here's how it plays out for <laughs> the client. And by the way, right now, right this minute, you know more about the probate process than 99 percent of the people that enter into the probate process for the first time. You do. And here's how it plays out: is that uh, the last surviving parent passes away. You've got four kids. One of them is named executor, the other three aren't. Well, what is a typical probate cost? Well, on average, you know, when, when we don't know many, for fa many facts, typically we, we quote around $5,000 for a probate. Some of them run less, and obviously some can run more. Um, that's, and on average, it's around $5,000. Uh, okay. That's, that's a good so think about this. The executor is working with the lawyer, and there is all of this time that is lapsing. And the other three aren't exactly sure what's really going on, because the executor is one that has all that information. And depending on how good a communicator that executor is, and how well that executor really understands what's really happening, they usually stumble and have a hard time explaining to the other three. So how does that appear to the other three? It appears that there's something fishy going on. Oh, no, by the way, that executor, maybe mom and dad put them on the checking account, so they've got access to start writing checks. Now something's not right. We're going on six months. I haven't gotten any money, and my brother's out there writing checks on mom's account. He's up to no good. And they say, I'm going to call a lawyer. I say, no, no, no. Or he says, I'm going to, he, I say, I'm going to call a lawyer. And my brother says, oh, no, 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 don't. It's $250 an hour. Don't call them. I, I'll, I'll do all of that. Gosh. Yeah. Now I'm really suspicious, right? Now something's not right. But all of this is, is, is most likely preventable. Most likely probate. How, would you say that probate could be prevented close to 100% of the time with, if it's done with right? With planning. Yeah, mm -hmm. with planning, absolutely, yeah. 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 I've seen more families ripped apart because of the delay in that planning process. And there's nothing fishy going on. <coughs> Poor executors doing the best job that they can. <coughs> They're trying to communicate something they don't really understand. And it's taking a, an eternal amount of time. <coughs> the other thing we know is that most inheritances are spent within the first three years. Mm -hmm. What that tells you is that the people receiving the money already know what they want to do with it, and now they're just waiting for it. <laughs> and it's not coming fast enough, right? Yeah. There might be another reason we don't want to go to probate, and might be another reason that a will in and of itself isn't enough. But we'll get to all that. Was there another question I thought I saw? If you have all your personal property and uh, investment accounts on a transfer on death deed, you can avoid probate, I'm assuming. 100% of the time. You know, when you're talking to a lawyer and you say, 
Can we get this result 100% of the time? <laughs> we can't go there. Um, so I'm not going to give you 100% of the time. I will say with proper planning, right, and proper titling, um, and then monitoring that, you know, at least about annually to make sure that how you have things titled still meets your wishes, right, and that you understand what happens if uh, one of your beneficiaries dies before you, where does their share go, right? You've talked to Greg about that. You've said, you know what, um, my, uh, my niece died. I want to make sure that her kid gets her share. What do we need to do with that, right? Or I don't want her kid to get that share. How do we prevent that? And so it, it is kind of a, a, a continual just double checking to make sure that what you have set up continues to meet your needs. So I'm not giving you 100%, I just can't do that. Would it still be advisable to have a will uh, and, and an executor to distribute like old small personal property that you sure. have made a list for? So the question is, is it still advisable to have a will just for some miscellaneous thing? A couple of things with that. Typically, um, if a client comes and just has accounts, right, and doesn't own any real estate. Oftentimes, we'll work with just setting up beneficiaries to make sure that the accounts are set up the way they want and they pass the way they want. With some personal property, uh, we can do that through, um, again, some, some transfer on death with some of it. Uh, vehicles, we do have in Minnesota now. Vehicle title, you can do a transfer on death vehicle title. Uh, if you want, that's newer in the last few years. Um, but we still do want that will just as a backup but oftentimes again the goal is we're going to have this will but we're never going to want to use it because we'll, we've taken our inventory of our six or eight or ten assets and each of those goes the way they're supposed to so all right um so you can't play stump the lawyer i'm okay. letting you know right now <laughs> <laughs> i just want to know if I, it's kind of back to back with his uh, what he's asking is if you have, let's say, um, accounts with Edward Jones, mm -hmm. and let's just say it equals three hundred thousand dollars, and you have three children, and it's transferable on death to them, does it go to them immediately without including an executor or um, probate or anything like that? If you have no will or you don't have that in a trust. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Yes. Okay. Remember, so then, remember. Then, then that particular title or registration or deed, you can check that off your list and that's done properly. That deed, deed's a different Yeah, so, so transfer death only applies to certain, so you're, we're going to make sure that you have beneficiaries or transfer on death on all of your important assets and both of those will supersede a will a beneficiary designation will also supersede a trust. So it comes first. That's interesting. It comes first. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I wanted Greg to answer that because your kids aren't going to call me, right? Because at 250 an hour, they're going to say, oh, we're not making that phone call. We're going to call this guy. <laughs> right? So that's, and that's the way it always goes. They call the financial advisor first, and that's the way it's supposed to go. Yeah. Can't can you do that with all your assets? You can do that with all your assets. Yep. There and then and there are ways that we handle real estate, right? Real estate's a little bit of a different bird um, than than the accounts. But a lot of times, if we have just accounts, we can set beneficiaries up, um, you know, and and make sure that things pass the way that we want. Absolutely. Ask the hard questions. What happens if beneficiaries die before us? So your question. Uh, I do not have a will. Mm -hmm and I have two daughters, mm -hmm. and their name are on all my bank stuff. Mm -hmm. And so do I really need a will? You know, here's, here's again, this is the, I don't know, right? I, I, or it depends, it depends on what your, um, how, when you say their names are on your bank account, I don't know if that means that that expires on death. If, uh, if they're co-owners, if, if after you die, they would have to go through probate to get access to those. So that would be a situation where you should go and chat with your banker and make sure that that is all set up so you know while you're alive what happens and in the event of your passing, what happens with those accounts if you want them to pass a certain way. And if you have real estate 
then there might be something else that we'd be looking at, uh, such as a trust or some other uh, mechanism to help avoid probate. Yeah. Rob, Rob, let's revisit those three questions that you, and, and if you will, take out your pen, and I actually want to write these three questions down. Um, but if you could revisit the three questions you asked them to ask their bankers and, and any, anyone that has um, assets of yours, make sure you ask them these three questions. Sure. I'm going to have to maybe have Jack re rerun the tape so I remember my question. <laughs> no, the, first, the first one is, we want to make sure that we're asking the question, who has access to my account while I'm alive and can sign checks, right? Um, and whether or not that's signing checks or with an investment account, who has access to that while I'm alive? So that I'm sure that whatever I've set up is what I want. And if you don't get the answer you want, work with them to get that answer, right? Then the next question is who has access to that account after I die, right? Because does that same person, does that authority expire when I die, okay? So then we're wondering about what happens after uh, who has authority after after you die? And then the last question really is, are they going to have to go through probate to get access to it? And if you would get any language about, well, that, that, that'll go to your estate. Remember, estate is code for probate. So don't let them, don't let them give you that answer. And, you know, ask for specifics about yes or no. Am I, do I have to go through probate? Will they have to go through COVID? So those are pretty important questions to ask. And then remember, it's a three-legged stool. You need to have three professionals that are willing to work together and collaborate for your best interests. You need to have an, a financial <coughs> planner. You need to have an estate attorney, not any attorney, but an, an attorney that specializes in estate law. And then you need to have a tax preparer. And then between the three of them, if it's something that we can handle and you don't have to pay that for the attorney, then, then that's great. But I'll also be very clear, I don't do law, I don't do taxes, and I will very clearly, you know, Rob and I will go back and forth, and we'll even talk and say, okay, which part do you do, which part do I do? Same thing with the tax repair. Um, we each have our own unique skill sets and our own unique value that we bring to the table for you. And you wanna make sure that those three individuals are working in concert for your benefit. Absolutely important. So if I don't have a will, but I do have a farm, do I make for sure that my girls' names are on there? Well, if you have real estate, then it's probably a very good idea to take a look at what options people with real estate have to avoid probate. Um, there are a couple of different tools with that, and we want to factor in taxes, right? Because sometimes people will just say, you know what, I'm putting my kid's name on the deed, period, and then we're not going through probate. That might be true, right? We put the kid's name on the deed, but then we say, oh, I want to sell that property, right? And then you go to your daughter and you say, well, I need to sell this property, and she says, no, right? Or her husband says no, right? I hate to say it happens, and I've oh, seen it. It does happen, absolutely. And so once you put somebody's name on that title, um, you have to work with them, okay? So sometimes that's a little, uh, a, a little risky, right? If they, if they die before you, right, we could have troubles there. If they get sick before you and need to go into long-term care, their interest could be subject to medical assistance, right? Because that could be an available asset in their estate, uh, their third interest or whatever in the property. And now again, I'm not the tax person, but if people inherit property by either through probate, you know that dirty word, or through a trust, right, they typically are going to get what's called a stepped up basis. So if you paid $50,000 for your farm and it's worth half a million dollars today, right, and you sell that farm, you might have a little bit of capital gains on that, right? However, if your kids inherit that through a trust or say through a will, right, um, they are going to get a stepped up basis. So if they sold it for 500000 there wouldn't really be a gain that they'd have to deal with. So we can win the battle and lose the war when we start adding people's name to the title. Okay? If everyone, because I know everyone's life is this way, right? Yeah, if everyone gets sick in the right order and they die in the right order and life happens exactly the way it's supposed to happen, that's a great plan. However, sometimes life happens on life's terms, right? 
and all of a sudden our daughter gets sick and we have a situation, right? Or uh, I meet somebody and I want to sell that house and move to Florida. That was one of my first cases in uh, 1995 or six. I had a, a gentleman who had um, uh, had his, his house tied up in what we called an, an AB trust or a credit shelter trust. Those are um, uh, trusts that we would use to minimize estate taxes. And he came to me and he said, you know, um, we set this trust up, my wife had cancer. And at the time we had, we had a taxable estate. And so we set this fancy trust up and when I died, or when she died, you know, we'd spent all the rest of our money and then this, this house went into this irrevocable, this irrevocable trust. And my son is in charge of it, right? And he said, now I've met somebody. It's been about five years after since his wife died. He met somebody and he wanted to move on with his life. He wanted to sell the property, right? And then he wanted to move to Florida with her. And the son said, no. And he said, you know, how could this possibly be? I set this up for his benefit, right? How could he possibly be doing this to me? It turns out that the son wanted that property. Because we also talked about do you want to just sell, could the son sell the house in Minnesota and buy one in Florida in the same trust, right? So we don't even change who owns the dirt, right? Then you, and then, and, and you and your friend can move to Florida. Son said no. He was in charge, right? And that's where who you pick is, is, is also very important. So um, again, it's, it's thinking through the results. And I don't know, did I, did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Did I finish it, get a will? And, and make sure you know how that property is going to transfer. And then let me also build on that. If you have a family business, oh, yeah. or if you have a farm or a large piece of land, and say you have three kids, and you're going to leave it to the three kids, do all three kids want to participate in that venture and enjoy that venture equally? Or is there one that really wants to take it and run with it, and two that have no interest whatsoever? which is probably the case. It's what we see more often than not. What do you do in that case? There are ways around that with appropriate planning. So how do you deal with a 16 ounce gold bar that was bought for $300 <laughs> that today is worth over 20,000 mm -hmm. on paper? I mean, the original bill of sale mm -hmm. is for 290 bucks. Mm -hmm. And if you, his spot is, is about $1,400 an ounce today. So, so I'm imagining that you don't need that money today, but instead want to... It goes into the estate. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, quite honestly, um, that's going to be valued at fair market value. Okay. Spot price. And then you're going to get a step up in cost basis, whoever inherits it. And then they're going to have to figure out how to sell it. So let, let's just kind of talk a little about that. Let's say that it's worth, uh, he bought something for 300 bucks, and, or somebody bought something for $300, and now it's worth 20,000. And so if you sell that, if it's a capital asset, right, um, you have to pay some capital gains be between what the sale price and your basis, which is basically what you paid for. So you'd have $19,700 on which you'd have to pay capital gains, okay? Now, if he dies and it goes to his kids through his trust, or uh, through uh, a probate, they'll get what's called a stepped-up basis. So it'll be worth the fair market value of the date of his death. And if we assume that's twenty thousand, and the kids sell it for twenty thousand, right? There's no gain. The kids sell it for twenty-one thousand. They have to pay gain on a thousand dollars. Okay, and that goes to the highly appreciated farm as well. The numbers get much bigger when we pay fifty thousand, and it's worth five hundred thousand today. We might want to. Um, Sometimes it's better if the kids inherit it through a trust or through even through probate because of the possible increase with the um, uh, step up in basis so that we could minimize the uh, capital gains impact of that sale. So this, this step up that Rob's referring to applies to whether it's a stock, a bond, mutual fund, a house, or a bar of gold. Oh, firearms. Firearms too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Cars. Yep. <laughs> You mentioned the average cost of a probate yep. is about five thousand. Mm -hmm. What would be the average cost of uh, estate planning if it was real estate and some invest 
You know, um, yeah, on, on average, okay. probates, you know, run in that $5,000 range. Some of them are less, some of them are more. Um, a lot of times, you know, trust planning is you know, in the $2,500 range. Um, the benefits of trust, trust planning, though, um, you avoid probate, plan for incapacity, you get some privacy, because we're not running through the courts, and ease of administration. I had a, I had a lady, the first trust I did was about, I'm going to say 1997 or eight, someplace in there, and I, I got a call from a friend of mine who said, my mom has cancer and she's, she's terminal and wants to die in her, her townhouse in Blaine. And I said, hmm, what are we going to do? And, he, and, and she didn't want to give the property to the, to the kids because um, there was a uh, reasons that, the, that one of the kids couldn't hold title to property and might have had a marital issue and so forth. And so we went ahead and uh, I backed into a trust because I was kind of forced into it. I was like, well, I gotta do this. So I had never done that before. I went ahead and did this trust. I went out and I met with her. We walked through all of it and she went ahead and signed the trust. I recorded the deed. And like most good lawyers uh, that was done, I didn't think about it again, right? It was over. Get a call six months later from my friend. And of course my heart stops because I'm like, oh, what did I do? Mm -hmm. Well, he just called to say, you know, I want to let you know mom passed about two months after you were out. Mm -hmm. And I just came from closing on the sale of the real estate. My brother and I split the proceeds and it couldn't have gone more smoothly. Mm -hmm. And I really haven't looked back from being a believer in trust since. I have seen them work very, very well for a lot of people to get really good results, to avoid probate, and really kind of keep in that gap. We don't have a lapse in authority with the trust, okay? Because um, everything is retitled, right? It's retitled in a, in a different way, so. Let me give you a very personal example, if I might, um, of my family, and something that didn't go the way my dad wanted it to go. So my grandmother had, had saved up um, her entire life and had a very nice nest egg. But later in life, um, in her mid-70s, she remarried and married a wonderful man. And they had a wonderful marriage that lasted many years. But eventually, Grandma passed away at 96. Well, as you would expect, um, Grandma thought she had everything set up properly so that her assets would go to her children and his assets would go to his children. Instead, what ended up happening was her assets went to her husband. Mm -hmm. Her husband has three kids. Mm -hmm. Guess where everything ended up? Mm -hmm. With the three kids, my dad got zero. Nothing. Now, was that what my grandma intended? Of course not. Of course not. But she thought everything had been set up appropriately, and she had listed her beneficiaries, and she had transferred on death, and all of this stuff, so mm -hmm. she was good, right? No, she wasn't, unfortunately. And a trust would have... A Q-tip trust, as uh -huh. a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke from last time. <laughs> yes, there is such a thing. Yeah, yeah. So, and then if we're not doing a trust, usually, you know, we're in, you know, about a quarter of that someplace, or uh, around the 750 range, give or take, for other planning. If we're not doing sort of a full estate plan with real estate. Those are the general figures. I, I don't know what other people charge. That's typically my, my range at this point, mm -hmm. so... Okay. Go ahead. Um, say um, you didn't have things set up at the bank properly mm -hmm. so that the kids couldn't write checks when you passed. And you had a house that went to probate. Mm -hmm. And it took six months. Mm -hmm. And all these bills are coming in, you know, electric or whatever, house payments, yeah. taxes. Who pays that if you can't write checks and no one? Well, if it's a solvent estate, right? Solvent meaning we've got more assets than we have liabilities. Um, a lot of times the personal representative, right, or your child is going to be advancing those dollars, right? The carrying costs, real estate taxes, utilities, I get that often. Um, uh, who's, who's paying utilities to keep the lights on, right, through the pendency of this? And then when the house sells, they get paid back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Michelle, you had a question? Yeah, so back to your case, Greg. Um, why did... If your grandmother had that estate all planned and she had a beneficiary transfer on death, then was married, why did that, why did her, that go away? Because, because her primary beneficiary was her husband. 
her contingent beneficiary was my dad. But once the assets transferred, then it was his ownership and he could decide what to do. So if she did not have her second husband as beneficiary and it stayed the same, that would not have been an issue. Do you follow me? Even though she was married to the second husband for 26 years, if she kept her will the same after she married him and did not have him on as beneficiary, it would, would have stayed the same with your dad. Do you follow me? Um, yes, depending so it wasn't on the, the specifics. So was the state that allowed that, is what I'm saying. It wasn't the state that allowed that. Your grandmother had him as beneficiary. Grandmother had, so yeah, so before before she was married, my dad was the primary beneficiary, yes. but then she got married, and then, you know, as, as 90, as most people would do, the primary beneficiary becomes the spouse. That's usually the default. And wow. so, so the money was, went to the husband first, and then to the children. And my dad was one of four children across the family. So she so. would have had a transfer on death deed to your father, that would have left um, her stuff to your dad. There, there are numerous sure ways it could have been prevented. Yeah. Numerous ways. What ways? Well, you know, I'll follow up and, and, and yeah. monitoring. Yeah. Yeah. What is your question? Uh, the question that I have is if you go to an attorney and have uh, estate planning documents uh, drawn up, such, such as I have right here. Sure. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's quite thick. Yeah. And my question is, things change within this mm -hmm. program. Yep. Such as addresses, phone numbers, uh, purchases, sales, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. How often should these be updated, or should they be? Um, you know, we we talk about wanting to make sure that those documents are are current, right? So if they need to be relied on, like a healthcare directive, uh, we want to make sure we've got the right addresses and phone numbers so if somebody needs to get in touch with a child um, they can do that because if you've got your kids landlines in there they don't have landlines anymore <laughs> so those kinds of things are pretty important with the health care directive it's also a good idea just to double check and make sure you're working with current updated forms okay and um, and and then with powers of attorney sometimes too we want to make sure that those are not very old um, Usually the rule of thumb is about five years for getting those updated. Um, most financial institutions would like to see them less than five years old. Um, the other time that you want to make changes, obviously, is if you have a change in your family, somebody passes in the right order, or, or sorry, somebody passes in the wrong order before you that you didn't plan on, or if um, you have new grandkids and you want to include those, or you have new kids and you want to include them for a different reason too. So again, that's kind of family specific. Uh, and what your trust says, and sometimes if you don't know what your trust says, it's not a bad idea to have it you know, reviewed and make sure that it still meets your current needs. Yeah. So. so I'd like to make sure that we cover off, I'm keeping an eye on the time here for us, to make sure we cover off on a couple of other very important topics that we need to make sure that we address. Um, we've talked about the durable power of attorney. A health care directive or a health care power of attorney, um, in the booklet that you have in front of you, in this one from the state of Minnesota, there is one in there, and I know Rob's going to have some comments to build on, but a health care directive is going to provide direction on your health preferences should you be in a position that you can't provide that yourself, and that's the key if you're not in the position to provide it yourself. Now, I'll say something. I think it's everybody's absolute responsibility to get this done because if you don't, you're laying that burden on someone you care about deeply and it's going to be an incredibly painful choice for them to have to make. And facing our own mortality is never a fun topic of conversation, but it is a responsibility we each hold to set forth the terms and conditions under which we want our final days to play out. But it's not just the final days. This could apply to you next week as well. And to that end, I'd like Rob to maybe expand a little further, in particular on the what does it mean to be unable 
and how does that contingency play into the execution of a health care directive? Sure. You know, um, a lot of times the health care directives, they talk about, you know, I, wanna, I want Greg to make health care decisions for me if I'm not able to make them. And that's pretty common language. Um, the trouble is that that, if I'm not able, can be considered a, a contingency or a condition that needs to be met in order for Greg to get authority to help make my, um, my health care decisions. And so when we're dealing with, um, you know, some dementia issues or uh, early onset Alzheimer's or we're dealing with uh, depression, which are uh, some things that some of us end up uh, um, having to... To, to manage, and we can have good days and we can have not as good days, right? So if I'm, in the, if I'm in seeing my doctor on Monday and I'm having a pretty good day, my doctor's thinking that I'm having a good day, that's fine. And then by Thursday, I'm acting kind of funny, right? And Greg knows that he's my healthcare agent. And he calls my clinic and he says, you know, Rob was in on Monday and you know, what went on in that meeting? Did he share anything with you? Did you adjust his meds or anything? Because he's kind of acting kind of funny now. And uh, the clinic might say, well, as far as we know, Rob's able to make his own health care decisions. So we uh, aren't going to talk to you. So that's one thing that with that prefatory language, it's a good idea to take a look at that and make sure that if you, if you don't want that condition out there for a spouse or for a child, that it's, uh, um, it's updated to the way that you want I think you probably know more, way more about that than I do. So uh, she has a wealth of information on that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. Good question. Yes. Does that check on the organ donor portion of your driver's license need anything more? Well, and the do not resuscitate that we've signed. Yeah, do not resuscitate is typically a different form from the health care directive. Okay. Okay. And then the checkbox on your license, my suggestion with that is make sure that um, your health care agent knows that that's what you want done. So that they have some um, direction from you as to whether or not that you want your organs donated and so forth. Okay. A couple of other things I wanted to just touch on briefly in terms of what can a trust do? If there's anyone in your life that you care about who has special needs and in your absence you'd like to make sure that they continue to benefit um, from your generosity, you may want to consider a special needs arrangement. Specifically um, because if you don't, providing you with an inheritance, they may not actually ever see any of that because they may owe money for treatment or services received. So that would be one area. The second one, restrict inheritances. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to give a 16-year-old access to half a million dollars. Doesn't sound like a good idea in any scenario. If I had a child that was a spendthrift and I knew that their financial priorities and mine didn't align. I might want to retain a little bit of, as I call it, control from the grave hmm. to ensure that they don't spend it all. As I mentioned, most inheritances are gone within three years. It's not my value system. I want to make sure that I, if I haven't instilled it in my lifetime, <laughs> you know, shame on me, but at least I'll make sure that it continues beyond that. Um, or if I you know, have someone that's struggling with um, an addiction. I want to make sure that I don't pour fuel on that fire, obviously. And so those might be reasons that we'd want to consider having a trust to provide that protection and the follow-through of your wishes. And then again, of course, tax benefits. There are ways to make sure that things are passed in the most tax-efficient way, depending on your particular asset base and your needs. Did you want to build on it in any way? Or? No. Okay. We talked about the role of a trustee. We talked about the fact that you need to make sure you get the right person in that job. Um, and I know I know you've got some pretty strong feelings about um, who that person should be. And should it be a person or should it be a professional? Well, let's talk just a little bit about the role of trustee. Uh, the role of the role of trustee is someone you're asking to carry out your wishes through either a trust or 
uh, sometimes through your will, but uh, again, a trust, let's say that the trust says, I uh, want to make sure that my kids don't have access to money until they're 30. Okay, so if I die, I've got three kids, uh, my estate uh, goes into a third, a third, a third, right? And I want the trustee to manage that third, a third, a third for each of my kids. And I want them to pay out, you know, say by the time they're 30, I want them to have it all paid out. But during that period, they can pay out for my child's health education, support, and maintenance, yes. right? So I have some Become. standard there, right, as to what the trustee can do as far as when they're determining whether or not this is a good idea or not a good idea. And sometimes we want to just name a child or we want to name an individual as a trustee. That can work, um, depending, on, again, on the relationship and how sophisticated that person is with managing the sorts of dollars that you're dealing with. If you have a $5 million estate or a $5 million trust and the person you want to be the trustee um, isn't sophisticated enough to manage $5 million, that might not be the best role for them. They might not understand how to do that. Now, other issues that can kind of come up is, you know, when you're when you're a trustee, sometimes, you know, you can't do, you. we're on TV, so I gotta be careful with this. <laughs> <laughs> not last time I could speak freely. Uh, so, uh, you have to be careful because you could be in trouble for either, either, either type of decision you make, okay? So, let's say that um, Greg again, is, uh, Greg's not good because he's, <laughs> He's a fiduciary. I don't want to get him in trouble. <laughs> Judy's my trustee. Uh -oh. right? Judy's going to be my trustee. And my son comes to Judy. And he says, you know, Judy, uh, I've been working really hard in school. I've been doing well. Um, and I got a job. And she says, well, that's great. you know." And he says, well, I'm going to be delivering pizzas. And she hmm. says, well, that's, that's a good first starter job. That's a great starter job. And he says, I need a car. Yeah. And Judy says, I, I can see that. You don't have wheels right now. That's fine. We can get a car. He says, I've picked up this 2020 Lexus. <laughs> and I know that would be great for delivering pizzas. And Judy might say, you know, maybe we should bring that in. And we can talk about maybe a, a 2010 Camry or something along those lines. Uh, but I'm not so sure that a, a Lexus is going to do that. Okay. So that's one example where that trustee can add that sort of uh, personal touch to helping them with their goals, uh, but not letting them kind of blow through all their money. The other issue that comes up with the trustee is sometimes, what do I do? The trustee says, what do I do? So same situation. My son goes to Judy and says, you know what? I have a great idea. I've got a buddy. Hmm. And he and I have decided that we're going to open up a microbrewery in Lindstrom. And we are going to have the best uh, brewed beer and it's going to be great atmosphere, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're going to make a ton of money, right? And Judy says, no. And he says, well, all I need is $100,000, and then I can buy it, right? So Judy says, okay, fine, we'll give you $100,000. So he goes in, and what happens to this microbrewery? Right? It goes back to the bank, right? And it's all, it all tanks. And so then he goes to Judy, and he says, well, I'm going to sue you because you should. Your your job was to protect me from me, right? <laughs> that was your job, Judy. Okay, and so why did you give me that hundred thousand when I shouldn't have? Okay, Judy, same facts, right? My son has a friend going to start a microbrewery in Lindstrom, and they're going to make it big. Goes to Judy and says, "Can I have a hundred thousand dollars?" And she says, "Absolutely not. That's not a good business investment, right?" Eight years later, everybody else is. Multi-millionaires got into that business. Now he wants to sue Judy because she should have given him the money, right? So there is a there is again a phrase that we use not on TV to put to, to describe the position that Judy's in, right? She can't really either way could cause troubles, and so that's where sometimes I do want people to really consider the possibility, right, of a of a um, corporate trustee. And they are in the position to do that. They know how to handle those situations. And, you know, from a lawyer's perspective, they typically have insurance to protect against uh, a, a decision that maybe looking back should have been a different decision. Mm -hmm. so. In your green folders, there is a form in there that talks about corporate trustees and questions you should ask before you hire one. So that's a good resource for you as well.
Please. How long does a trust last? So say you write it up today, you die tomorrow, and you've got kids that are in their 30s. Like, and so they, does the trust live forever? Or just until they die? I mean, or is it two grandchildren? I mean, like, how long does this trust last? It depends. <laughs> it depends on, on, what, on what the terms are. Sometimes we say, uh, for a period of 10 years after my death, uh, pay out you know, a, a share each year. Sometimes we say we want it for their life, right? Some of the, some of the supplemental needs trusts that, that he had up there earlier, some of those will go until the kids are in their 60s, right? And then different government benefits would take over and, and start to supplement that. So um, it really depends on what the terms of the trust say. Um, and, and if the kids are old enough and they're responsible, and let's say you know you pass and the kids are all in their 30s, um, they could wrap that thing up in a few months and call it good, right? So it can go pretty slick and it can go pretty quick. Um, but if we have kids, grandkids, uh, uh, or other needs, it could go for, for quite a while. So Rob, I'm, I'm hearing that as long as it's within the realm of being legal, if you can articulate what it is you're trying to accomplish, there's probably a trust or another mechanism that'll get you there. It's just a matter of really understanding the, what do you want and what are the different scenarios that could arise that you want to safeguard for or against. Mm -hmm. yeah. The unexpected. So if you've gone through all that, you've got your name, not a professional, but a personal, trustee and then the unexpected they die you die all of a sudden you have no trustee well usually we have at least one or two backup trustees listed oh. and sometimes two then we'll we'll have in there that a uh, person represent uh, let's say let's say that it's your sister and your sister says you know I just can't do this anymore a lot of times we'll have in there that the, the sister can appoint another trustee or particularly can appoint a corporate trustee mm -hmm. And you had a question. Yeah, I, I can see where it could be a disaster to have a family member be a trustee. <laughs> <laughs> it, can, it can also work very well, right? Yeah. And, and, and just different families in different ways, but yeah. I have a personal example of a problem that occurred in my family with a living will. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother passed and she wanted to be cremated. I was the executor and she also had filled out the proper forms, Minnesota um, Cremation Society, and explained to me her reasoning, and that was fine and everything, but, and I assumed she had talked with my brother about that, mm -hmm. and she passed, and assuming he knew about it, I was talking casually about it, and he was just shocked mm -hmm. and blown away and really upset, he's totally, opposed to cremation. He and I had never discussed that either. So um, he eventually got used to the idea because he had to, but had she talked to him ahead of time about that, it would have That's, saved yep. a whole lot of yep. a few A few people uh, who've been through my office understand I do try to talk about setting expectations with your family. If you want to be cremated and you think that might be an issue for them, let them know. Uh, sometimes if we're, we're not going to let kids get money until they're 40, uh, maybe let them know uh, so they have some expectation of that because sometimes after you pass and they find all the stuff out, that can be kind of hard because they can't have a conversation with you anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things, setting those expectations is really, really important with your overall estate plan for your family. I also know there are some times or we don't want to do that for one reason or another. Sometimes that's going to cause more trouble while you're alive and you don't want to deal with it while you're alive. So some people choose a different way. So. <laughs> All right. Very good. Just one question. Sure. Uh, my financial advisor gave me something to think about, about gifting to my children uh, before I die. Mm -hmm. That I can watch them use their money and raise my grandkids Mm -hmm. with my money yes and uh, I thought that's a good idea but is there any I hear there should be a trust involved or, or a trustee to manage that money well you, you know what we're gonna say <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so I agree with you absolutely um, 
the the personal joy of being able to watch the um, watch your money in use. I don't know how to measure that. Yeah. That that's a that is uh, Mastercard priceless, right? right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can gift up to fifteen thousand per person per year, right? So that could be husband, wife, kids. You mm -hmm. could it's a family of four. You could give sixty thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. okay? And you can enjoy that. Now, once you gift it, it is out of your control. Yeah. You have no control. Uh, they could go buy a Ferrari tomorrow with that money if they wanted to, and so be it. Yeah. You, you have no recourse. Yeah. So it depends on what your goal is and what you would like to see them do with that and how likely they are to do as you would do. So are you going to put some strings attached to it? Uh, a, a, a trust kin, and I'll let Rob uh, talk about strings, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, a, a trust will give you the control that pure gifting would not. Thank you. Yeah. Can I share a gift with you that my folks did for the grandkids? They gifted, and it could only be gifted when they set up a rock for the kids. Oh. It was the best gift. It had to go direct transfer. The kids didn't get the money, but as soon as they set it up, it, and every, my kids contribute out of the rock. Every single grandkid. And, and that, that's a wonderful story. Just keep in mind that the children have to have earned income for that to work. As long as they've got a paper out like I had, that would be yeah. perfect. We're running out of time, but let's see if we get two in real quick. There's also 529 plans, which say this is for college education, and yeah. you can still have your name on that account with their, that grandchild's name on that account, and um, be involved, and yet their name's there. So if you pass, that money is set in the 529 and has to follow the 529 rules. So that's a great Thank you for that. That's a great idea. She's, that's a great idea. This will be the last question that wants to do a gifting is in a nursing home. And right now they're able to afford the private pay. Can they still do that? How many years? Like say, can they still get? Long as they have money. Five year look back. I want you to thank Greg and Thank you.